Hey now, Brawlers, today we're going to take a look at Winter Tales from Fantasy Flight Games. And Fantasy Flight Games actually picked up this game from a European publisher, I believe, who had released it originally. It's actually been out for quite a while, and this is just the newest Fantasy Flight release. I think they may have updated some of the components, things like that, but for the most part, it's the same game, just in case you already have an earlier version of the game, or that's the one you happen to stumble across and you want to pick it up. What is this game? Well, the plot of the game is that uh, there are all of these different fairy tale characters like Snow White. White, Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter, the White Rabbit, Pinocchio, um, the wolf, the Big Bad Wolf, who's just called, I think, the Wolf in this one, um, and all these different other characters that I've actually never heard of. I think they're more akin to uh, European fairy tales or the, the European versions of the fairy tales that we know, like Manjo Fuko or some guy in a wheelchair thing. I don't know some of these, but <laughs> uh, this is like all these different characters in a very dark, surreal fairy tale world. Think of it as like the Tim Burton version, but even darker of a lot of these fairy tale characters. And the basic plot is that they're involved in a war. You have uh, there's the spring faction and the winter faction. The spring faction are called the rebels and the winter faction are called the soldiers. And on the winter side, you have Snow White, of course, the Mad Hatter, the White Rabbit, uh, and the others, but and the wolf. But on the spring faction, you have Pinocchio and you have Alice and uh, some of the others. Uh, the names are escaping me at the moment. but uh, Or uh, Dorothy, who's now very old, and the Tin Man, just some other examples. Uh, so all these different fairy tales come together in this really dark, surreal world, and they're engaged in this war, and the, the soldiers want to keep it winter forever, and the, the winter faction, and the, the rebels, the spring faction, want to make spring come about again. It all seems very basic. Now, where does it go from there? Well, that's up to you. This is a storytelling game, and if you're familiar with my channel, if you've seen some of my other videos regarding storytelling games, you know that I've had some very uneven experiences with them, usually leading towards bad. Story War is a horrendous game, and uh, I didn't... Tales of Arabian Nights had some really good things going for it, but just totally fell flat for me. I haven't officially reviewed Agents of Smirch, but I had a bad experience with that game as well, though I should probably try it again, so... I was really enthralled with the art on this one, and I wanted to give it a try, even against my better judgment. Because what this is, just like those games, you're taking part in a story, but much more so than, say, Tales of Arabian Nights or Agents of Smurfs, you're coming up with a story. Think of this as if you've ever played the card game Once Upon a Time. It's like Once Upon a Time mixed with a co uh, competitive board game, uh, where you're actually move you're taking control of the different characters in this fairy tale, putting in yourselves on different factions, the spring or the winter faction, and if there's an odd number of players, there's a player that's neutral, it's called the writer, and you're moving about the board trying to solve quests, and you're doing that by playing abstract cards and telling parts of a story. I don't want to say too much more, let me go ahead and give a brief overview of the game, then we're going to come back and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, let me walk you through Winter Tales. Now, by its very nature, there's a lot of abstract stuff in this game. So uh, a lot of this is just going to be open to interpretation and imagination. You're going to hear me say that word interpretation a lot during uh, some of the other parts of this video. But it's that's what the game is. This is a storytelling game. It's a narrative game. It goes from three to seven players. And it takes the world as that of a fairy tale world, sort of a twisted fairy tale world, where there's a lot of familiar characters. Like, uh, just to show you some examples here, you have Snow White, who uh, is, I guess, kind of evil. I mean, it's up, it's up to the players whether or not these characters are evil or not. But she belongs to the Winter Faction, who's trying to keep the world in eternal winter. Um, some other examples, you have the the wolf, who's supposed to be like the big bad wolf, who looks really, really grotesque. Um, on the Winter Faction. You also have the White Rabbit from Alice in Wonderland on the Winter Faction. Uh, and they want to keep the world in eternal winter. But on the other side, you have the Spring Faction. You have Alice, who's probably my favorite art of this whole thing because of being in a straitjacket. This looks really, really cool. Um, you also have the Scarecrow, who also looks really, really cool. Um, there is Dorothy as well, who is elderly in this game. 
And the other cool one is the Tin Man, who looks really super cool. So um, this is a team game, if you didn't already get that. So each team is going to be either the Winter Faction or the Spring Faction. Now, if you play with an odd number of players, then you're also going to have a character who is known as the Writer. And the Writer is a neutral faction who doesn't want either side to win. They want to keep things in balance. And it's very difficult for the Writer. I don't recommend playing with odd number of players if you can avoid it. Um... One player is also going to be designated as the story arbiter. You'll decide this at the beginning. It should be the person who's most familiar with the game or recommends the owner of the game if it's your first time. And like I said, this is a storytelling game. And what the story arbiter's uh, job is, is to make sure that all the stories that the players tell link together into at least a somewhat comprehensible narrative. This is a fairy tale. It's so not everything has to make total sense. But it should all link together. Now, at the beginning of the game, someone, probably the story arbiter, whoever's most experienced with the game, is going to set the stage. Now, there's some suggestions in the book, and there's some blurbs in the rule book as far as what all the characters' backstories are. And each person in the game is also going to get one of these cheat sheets that tells you a little more about each of the different locations on the map. And also on the other side, it tells you how to actually play the game and how the turn structure goes. But you want to set the... You want to set the setting of the game. And you also want to put out a couple of these quest tokens. The quests are like the main impetus of the game as to how you, the goals you're going to have to set for yourself to go through and actually accomplish what you're going to try to accomplish for your side, either the spring or the winter faction. And just a couple of examples. So one of the spring faction quests, um, I think it's called the Love That Melts Snow. So they'll tell you a little tiny bit about what this represents in the book, but you're mostly supposed to make up the story at, on your own. So for instance, the Love That Melts Snow is that you're supposed to get two of the spring faction characters, the rebels, to hook up, either in friendship or in romance or in like paternal love, um, but to love each other and just gain power from that. Um, you also have... The, let's say here's an example of a winter faction token this one as indicated by the uh, skull in the snow is just about your goal if you're trying to complete this quest for the winter faction is to bring about absolute terror and fear among the rebels among the spring faction but how you do that and what it, that actually means that's totally up to you now most of the action in this game oh and by the way you do have character cards here as well that represent each of the different tokens out there if you're ever on your turn you'll flip this over to the inactive side uh, this kind of fractured side which indicates that character has been used for this turn and the round structure is going to go that each player goes around uh you'll have multiple characters under your control two of them and each you'll Activate one of your characters, move them, do storyline activities with them, and then move on to the next player. And then it goes around again until everyone's activated both of their characters. Now, you also have a first player token here. I'll just show you some of the different things. Um, and then you have the epilogue token. This is going to indicate when the story is going to end. So it recommends that you start put this in the fourth spot when you start off. But you can do an advanced game and have more chapters if you would like. Um, when a quest is successfully completed... It will be put on top of each of the different chapters of the story in the place that you desire. And that will indicate you're getting closer and closer to finishing the story. Now, each player is going to start... Oh, i got to stop saying now. But <laughs> each player in the game gets these story cards. And they're on Winter's Faction or Spring Faction. It's the same picture on both sides. But when a quest is completed, the winning faction of that quest is going to put the card on the board in that spot. So you want to make sure it's on your appropriate side to see who actually won that. If the writer was able to successfully uh, keep things in balance, then you'll use one of these neutral cards in the spot uh, in any case. So the the goal of the game, like I said, is to tell stories. Well, it's about completing the quest, but you're going to do that all through storytelling. And you even have to do that to move. So each player is going to get some of these story cards, and they all have very abstract images that was actually drawn by children, 5-year-old and 9-year-old. Um, and it's up to you to interpret what this is. So... Like, you look at this card here. Let me uh, focus that a bit. You might say this is the start of a race. Or you, like, someone, like, that's the starting gun and these people are going to race. Or you might say it's like a religious ceremony where people are getting baptized. Or, uh, I mean, it could be any number of different things. You could look at this and say, well, that's like a, a phonograph, I think is what it's called. Or you could say it's a flower. Or, you know, something else altogether. It could be like a, a shooting star or something. However you want to hold the card, it even matters. Um, you could say that these are peanuts. You could say that they're bullet holes. You could say that they're, you know, like hail. There's all different types of ways you can interpret these cards. That's entirely up to you. 
but every time you do something, you have to play a card. So when you move, you're allowed to move up to two spaces, and when you do that, you pick your character, you flip over their card indicating that you activated them, and then you move them, and then you play a card with that. And you could say, let's say Alice wants to move into the plaza, and uh, let me just pick something here, something at totally random. Um, okay. She could say that um, she sees a light in a watchtower in the plaza, and she's drawn to it like moth to a flame, uh, seeking the warmth of that only spring can bring. I didn't mean to rhyme, sorry. And uh, <laughs> and she pursues that light. I don't know. It's hard for me to come up with this stuff without getting into the mood, but that's what you have to do. So you'll move there, and different things might happen. So if you go into the spot with a soldier then or vice versa if a rebel uh, if you go into a spot if a rebel goes into a spot with a soldier the soldier might want to battle if a soldier the winter faction goes into a rebel space they may the rebels may spring a trap but either way it's a battle and that's where each player is actually going to play story cards that they have down to the table describing how they try to battle or try to capture the opposing player and you'll go back and forth you're weaving together the tale of the story like um, this character, I forget his name off the top of my head. I think it's, uh, that might be the Mad Hatter. But, uh, yes, that's the Mad Hatter. And the Mad Hatter, uh, well, appropriately enough, is going to try to capture Alice. And you play a story card and you might say something like, um, there, he, he pulls the lever on all the, this contraption with all these spinning gears and it <clears throat> winches up the road and it might try to ensnare uh, Alice in this net made of concrete and brick. In which case, Alice, if she has story cards, may respond. Um, and let's see, she could say, this is a rope, and she gets away. I, I don't know. It's hard for me to make up the stuff on the fly, like I said, without getting into the mood of the story. But you have to make up a story that actually ties together with what the other player built off of. You can't have a closed story where you just say, well, I shoot you and you die. I mean, there's no player elimination either, except under very specific circumstances. So you have to leave it open for the other player to tell and continue the story. And theoretically, you can just keep playing cards until one side runs out of cards, but you're supposed to be weaving a story. When you think that the story is over, when you think you don't have a good response, you can end. In the case of a battle or a trap, then that might incapacitate the other character temporarily. But if you move to a spot where there's a quest token, and there's very, there's some specific rules about how quests can be put on the board that is kind of irrelevant at this point. If you move to a spot where there's a quest token, you actually have a choice. You can either try to put a new quest on the board, or you can try to resolve that quest. When you resolve that quest, you'll take this candle marker to indicate that that quest is ongoing. And then all you start off the story of the quest. Like If it's the uh, love that melts snow, and it's the scarecrow there, the scarecrow might say that, um, he wants, you know, he realizes that the only way to bring about spring is for him to gain his humanity. And he realizes that the most important thing about being uh, a human, about being real, uh, being a real flesh and blood creature is love. And so he decides that that is what his impetus is. That is what he must seek and that is what he must gain in order to thaw you know, the world of winter. And now all the other players have an opportunity if they have active characters that haven't been flipped over to move closer to where the Scarecrow is. So you never go on a quest on your own most of the time. You're going to be drawing people to you both from both factions to take part in the quest. And that's when everyone gets to play story cards and try to weave the narrative through as long as it all makes sense and it actually comes together in one solid narrative. And then at the end of that, whoever has played, whichever faction has played the most story cards, is going to be able to put one of their story cards of their choice out on the board uh, for on the side of whatever faction they are as a win, quote unquote, together with the quest token. And then you'll actually put this little story marker on it on that card as well, just to indicate that that is the last thing that happened. And so all the rest of the quests and things that happen in the game, regardless of whether you choose how many quests you do or where you choose to start off with the epilogue marker, they should tie into that. So you're always building off of the story. Now, everything I just described for the most part is the basic game. There are advanced rules, which I do recommend that you play with. Most of them involve the objectives. So each player would actually get a secret objective at the start of the game that will tell you uh, different things that you yourself are trying to accomplish um, you know, using certain items or trying to go to certain locations and do certain things there. Um, and you keep that secret into yourself even from the other players, I believe. At least that's how we played it. Um, you also have special abilities 
skills on the bottom of each of your characters that you might be able to use. Um, some of them have to do with movement, so you might be able to move extra spaces uh, for for free, or you might be able to change your objective cards or make objectives easier for yourself. Um, you might be able to draw extra story cards here. You know, just extra things that add a little more flavor to the game and keep the game moving and faster. There's also special power tokens, um, which after you complete a quest, you'll gain a special power that's directly linked to that quest. So for instance, in the love that even melts snow, if you completely, if you successfully complete that quest for your faction, you'll get the power token that corresponds to that, which lets you and the person that you're in love with or who loves you move together and do stories together all the time, which really makes thematic sense. Um, uh, just for the record, these tokens over here are what you choose at the beginning of the game to determine what your faction is. So you just draw one at random. Um, you know, I'd like to see more, but that's basically the game. I mean, it's a storytelling game, so it's really what the players bring to it. Everything here is just the trappings of the rules, but the goal is to just tell a story and try to have fun. That's Winter Tales. This is probably one of the toughest reviews I ever had to do. I'll just say this right up front. I like this game. I like it better than probably all the other storytelling games I've played. Once Upon a Time is cool, though. I kind of want to try that again, but... This is probably one of the best ones, and is going to stay in my collection for now. The thing about it is, I played, I played it twice. Well, I've, two and a half times technically. One game we just kind of gave up at the beginning. The first game did not go well at all, so we won't even count that. The two ga full games that I played, I played with two different groups of people. One of them went horribly, not fun at all. One of them was great. Okay, and I have a feeling that if I played this game another two times with two different groups of people, I might have the same result, a good game and a bad game. And I think that's how this game is going to be. It's going to be very, very polarizing. Now, let's kind of back it up and start from the beginning. And I mentioned this in the start that what attracted me to this game was the artwork, and it does not disappoint. The board looks gorgeous. All the character art, while it's disturbing for sure, especially like, say, the wolf, uh, and the uh, the fox and the cat or whatever it is who are, are like stitched together It can be very disturbing, but some of them could just be beautiful and regardless of whether you think it's disturbing or not It's just very very well done uh, Everything just looks really really cool It was a really cool concept with the story cards where they actually if you look in the rule book It'll tell you that they actually had a five-year-old and a nine-year-old do the art on the story cards and it hence it looks very and they just said you know just draw something very basic and hence it looks very abstract and it just leaves your imagination open to you know interpret it however you want that is a really cool concept everything just looks really really good and enticing and it's it just makes you want to go into this world and experience it now where the issue comes in is whether or not you're the type of player who actually wants to put in the work to flesh out this world. If you look in the book, they're going to give you a basic plot line of what's happening. of the, the spring faction engaged in battle with the winter faction. They have little blurbs of backstory for all the different characters and for also the locations on the board as well. And that helps you. That's like a good starting point. But after that, you're on your own. I mean, even with the quest tokens, they give you a little bit of information, but you have to take that basic framework and spin it out into something grandiose. And that is where the game shines. If you actually tell a consistent storyline, the game plays much, much better than if you're just spouting a bunch of nonsense. And I hate to say that because everyone is different. And what people find entertaining, and what people find creative, and the imaginations of people are all different. But because this game is... There, this unlike a lot of other story games, except for you know Tales of Arabian Nights and Agents of Smurfs, which are board games. This is also a board game with some very definite rules. The rulebook is actually rather heavy. I mean, that's kind of like Fantasy Flight's uh, status quo at this point is making big, almost incomprehensible rulebooks, and the rulebook is not great for this. It's okay, uh, but it does have you know a definite set of rules that you have to follow. But if you only play the game by just following the rules, <laughs> what it essentially comes down to is playing cards and hoping that you have the most cards. And that's just not great. Uh, it's just not fun at all. And in the first game, uh, the first little half game that we played, not even a half game, and another game, the, the game that went horribly wrong, um, what people were doing was just counting the cards that everyone had when they would get engaged in battles or engaged in the quests. And 
saying, oh, well, we have more cards, so we're going to win. So I'm just going to keep playing cards and making up some nonsense that very tangentially goes along with the cards. And it's... But there's a story arbiter in the game, but it's really hard for the story arbiter. The story arbiter in this game is not supposed to be a judge like in that crappy game Story War. The arbiter here is just supposed to say, hey, you know, I don't think that that part of the story ties in with what everyone else has said. Could you just, like, work on it a little more? Could you flesh it out more, actually link it together with what, with what others have said and what the setup of the storyline was in this world? But when people just want to play their cards no matter what and just say nonsense, that puts a lot of emphasis on the story arbiter to too much, you know, too much impetus on the storyteller to act or the arbiter to make this into something comprehensible, which is the most fun that this game is when you're actually telling a coherent story. The game that went really, really well was with a smaller group of players and that's another thing this is a game that i believe is works very very well with a smaller group of players and an even number of players i don't think if you play with an odd number of players like i said in the overview you have to use the writer which is the neutral character and i don't think that works very well here there's other games that are like that too um like in bloodbound totally different games but again the neutral odd characters don't work well in that and other types of team games and i don't think it works that well here either um, it's really, really hard for the writer, for the neutral character, and it's just, it really feels like the odd man out. It's not just an expression. Uh, so an even number of players and a smaller amount of players, I think, is the best way to play this game. And when I played this game with four people, all of whom I was good friends with and who could, t who were into the storyline, who really wanted to tell the story and were immersed in this world like I was, this game was awesome. Okay, but the reason why I said at the beginning of this that I only like this game and that it's only in my collection for now is because I don't know how much, how many more times I'm going to have that situation arise. Most of the people in my group are not going to be into this. This is why I said that the game is polarizing. Most people who want to play modern board games want to play it for the strategy, the depth, the mechanics, the moving things around. Even if you're talking about an Ameritrash game, it's all about rolling that dice and getting those combat stats and knocking out your opponent. This is not that game. It doesn't, it should not even matter who wins or who loses. The game that I really enjoyed of this, I didn't care. Our side lost. Who cares? We told a really cool story. And it's, it's just an experience, and I don't think that that's going to happen all the time. Uh, it's definitely not going to happen all the time in my group. So I don't know how often I'm actually going to get to play this, how much I can get the same group of people together. They all had a good time, though, too. But the people in the bad games that I had, I was me and, like, one other person had an okay time in those games um, and saw that the game could be something good. The other people were like, I ain't playing this again. So it's... Do I recommend this? It's it, it's just that there's a, a narrow audience that's gonna like this. Um, if you like storytelling games in general, certainly you should give this one a try because I think it's probably one of the best. I, I definitely think it's one of the best. Um, especially, you know, but even if you like games like Tales of Arabian Nights or Agents of Smirsh, those games sort of thrust you into pieces of the story more than having you make it up for yourself. So it's not a guarantee that you're gonna like this. You have to be willing to work for it. If you like Once Upon a Time, definitely check this out because it's much more in that wheelhouse. It's just more complex and longer. Um, going back to just how the different mechanics are, definitely play with the advanced rules. Don't even bother playing just the base game. I don't even know why they didn't just mix it all together. It's, it's stupid. You need to be playing with the skills and with the objective cards. Um, it adds that much. It adds that bit of gaminess to the game that keeps it grounded and keeps it actually as you know. Not that it's like a strategic game with that, but it does keep you more on your toes. And if you mix it well with the storytelling, I think it gets it goes together really well. Actually, having something to work towards, having the special powers um, to use, you know, when you can in a very strategic way, uh, that all adds a lot to the game. I I believe um, other people. But, you know, other people might just want to tell the story, and that's okay. You do have that option, but I think, especially if you're coming from the stance of being used to more strategic, heavy board games, play with the extra stuff right off the bat. I recommend this for people who like storytelling games. I think that other people need to try it first, especially if they've had bad experiences like I did in the past, but 
Man, it's definitely a unique experience. I'm glad that I had it. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful game to behold, that's for sure. And I think um, I'd be happy if Fantasy Flight Games came out with more and more creative games like this because I love Fantasy Flight Games, but this is definitely something that's different for them, and I'd love to see them sort of diversify like that. So kudos to them. I like the game a lot. It's not for everybody, and I don't know how long we'll be able to hold it if it's not going to get played, but... Um, I am very, very happy that it exists. My name is Nick. This has been Board Game Brawl. And I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day and in every way. Take care.